You are ravishing. How lovely to see you. You are ravishing. <laughs> I'm old. <laughs> no, you look so be. It's like just this breath of fresh air came in. Dame Janet, thank you. I'm thank so happy to see you. Well, I'm, I thank you for asking me to do this. It's, it's a wonderful opportunity to see you. Well, we missed each other in this summer. I know we did. The conversation we were to, to do, one of many heartbreaking cancellations. I, I, miss, I do regret that, but there we are. That's life, isn't it? There we are. And are you here, okay? Are you okay? Are you well? I'm, I'm doing well. I'm healthy. Um, I've eaten miraculously well over these last six months in Spain, fresh food and fish and, and enjoying the sunshine. And those odd moments of quiet bliss smacked right against this insanity that, and the darkness that we're living. So not a lot of middle ground in these days, but a lot of, of highs and lows. Yep. Yeah. And you, how, we spoke a little bit at the beginning of this, but yes, to hear how you are. Life, life for me is, has gone on in the same way because um, apart from the fact that I've not been able to see my friends mm -hmm. and, and, and larger groups, but that's beginning again in a, in a modest kind of way. We can, we can meet um, a six, something like that. So six of us can meet together. But yeah. you see, the kids are all partying, aren't they? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's, um, it's, a, it's, I, I lose the, the words to describe everything that this feels like. Um, but we're in it and here we are and we're improvising our way through this as human beings and as an industry, I think, which is, I wrote you just yesterday, two days ago yesterday to say, this is a crazy idea and it's very last minute. I'm a little embarrassed, but in the true spirit of grand improvisation, you agreed to, to talk with me today. And I'm so grateful for your time and your, your presence here. Well, it's great to see you. Well, it's good to be seen. <laughs> it's a heaven to see you. Listen, there's, of course, I hope we have many more conversations going forward because the topics with you are infinite. But I am getting to, ready to do this program, uh, a new kind of format for the Metropolitan Opera, um, uh, a live streamed concert or recital. And I spent a lot of time trying to formulate what I wanted to do with this concert because it didn't feel right to me to give a concert that I could have given a year ago because the world is so different and my presence and my um, searching at this moment is so different than it was a year ago. And so I've made the hopefully not too insane choice to go headlong right into the eye of the storm at the start of the concert and try and meet the world where it is, which is a place of, as I see it, confusion, rage, loss, um, despair, because there was something artistically, artistically with me that I didn't, couldn't get on with the rest of the program until I confronted that. And so I've chosen Adio Roma into the big scene of, of Daido, of Didon from Les Troyens, um, everything leading up to her monologue. And capturing, bookending that first part with Ich bin der Welt abandon gekommen. So you can imagine how much you have been on my mind and in my ears and, and serving as inspiration as I've been preparing this. So I wanted to take the time to speak with you in particular about the Didon and the Mahler in particular, because you, when I reference those pieces, <laughs> everybody's first name is, ah, Dame Janet Baker, because you have ref referential performances of these pieces. And I would love to hear some of your thoughts about what's it like to perform those pieces and what it, how you would imagine you would perform it today if it would change in the context of where we are. So can we start with the Didon? We begin, um, the, the, the alarm is sounding that her beloved Enea has left and 
in real rage, she uh, decides she wants to burn him down. And, and I think it's the greatest, most extraordinary, profound rage aria of all in opera, this whole scene. She speaks of wanting to burn them, to dismember his son and spread the limbs into the sea. She has so much anger, she doesn't know where to put it. And then she realizes it's futile. Perhaps the only way out is death. And this is where we are. Can you talk to me a little bit about your experience with Didon and, and what she meant to you? It's interesting that the three things you've chosen uh, particularly the, the two operatic extracts um, are the old way of expressing an eternal aspect of a woman's life. They're both great, strong women. Uh, and I'm sure this is your experience as well. Uh, singing characters of, of the same period, it, it always strikes me that what I'm trying to get out of, out of the character is the fact that this is women today. They are expressing exactly the same sort of thing that women go through today. Uh, and therefore our uh, ability to enter into these great, great strong women is um, helped by the fact that we understand their position. Mm. There may be uh, characters of thousands of years ago, the music may sound quite different, but we are portraying exactly the same kind of emotions that people can connect with now. See. Um, therefore, in that sense, it's easy. Um, singing about betrayal, uh, singing about revenge, thinking about anger and what happens to women all the time, and men too, of course. Mm -hmm. um, it it's always strikes me that, there's, that one is singing music of a certain period of time, which puts it into context in the sense of sound, but in the sense of motion, it's completely contemporary. Mm -hmm. I find this is one of the sources of comfort that I think music can bring people, and art in general, literature as well, that you can experience this once removed. So you're not living it, but you're watching somebody else live it out. And you can so completely identify with things that we're not allowed to talk about in everyday society. And it's things that we usually, as Didon says, put it in to devour it within yourself, she says. Yet we can look at that and say, I'm not alone. And this is not the first time this has been experienced. And I find that comforting. I think it helps to realize as that background of, of experience, which is familiar to everybody, no matter mm -hmm. whether they've experienced what we're trying to tell them at the time on the stage, but the fact that in real life, they understand exactly where we are, where we're coming from, and what we're trying to say. Mm. One of the things that I loved about your portrayal of Didon, there's this wonderful YouTube video, I'll, I'll link to it here if I can figure out technically how to do it. Um, you're singing in English, uh, and it's, um, it's the monologue into the aria, Adieu Ferocité. And this is, I think, what you were masterful at on the stage is you knew how to portray the queen, Didon. She is always a queen in your portrayal. But the woman is, is coming full front. She, somehow you managed to maintain the dignity of her stature, but the total sense of loss as the woman, as she's coming undone, as she's choosing to go into, into this this final place of despair. Do you, do you think this is a, a, a difficult thing to achieve? 
I, 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 I'm I, going on to my last thoughts of this, that the connection, the strong connection I feel with all these great women I've portrayed uh, are, are not removed from me in time because they're, they are uh, experiencing um, and uh, portraying for the, the modern audience things which happen now. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new under the sun, in other mm -hmm. words. Uh, if we look at it like that, that we're, we're acting out or, or being somebody else of another time and another place, it's so exciting to realize that women in the audience or people in the audience who have gone through the same sort of thing, like loss, um, bereavement, uh, losing children, losing anything, mm -hmm. uh, the sense of loss, the, 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 the um, emotions that we are asked to spread out, spread in, in front of everybody, are the same. Um, and, and therefore, I, I was always very, very conscious of, of the link between what I know of the world as a human being uh, and what I extract from the score, it's the same. We're the same people using, mm -hmm. using the same things and understanding the same things. So how did you, with that, this is why it's so compelling when you sing because the, um, that's my hotel room, I'm so sorry. Um, uh, no danke! With, oh, got that. <laughs> um, uh, is that direct emotional connection that's so visceral when you sing. What was your key to keeping the, the connection and the balance, but not going too far that, that you would lose the supreme technical command and the discipline of the voice that, that you... Our saving grace is the fact that we are a being a score. We have our boundaries and they're there on a piece of paper if you stick to the boundaries as loyally and as truly as you possibly can, that sort of shape, that sort of uh, being held by what the composer's written in terms of notes and time and uh, timing, um, are, the, are the rock on which we build. Um, uh, and I, I've always thought in, in teaching how terribly important it is to look at the score so deeply on one's own mm -hmm. uh, and try and, and absorb exactly, as exactly as you possibly can, what's written on the page. Because with the great composers, he's always told you everything you want to know. Yeah. Uh, and, and therefore one is held by the conductor, of course, but by the disciplines that are going around you. On top of that, if there's, there's a deep, knowledge of what's written on the page one's then free to accept whatever emotion is happening to you and one is deeply as you know very affected by what you're singing about um uh and i think the magic of, of what we do is probably made possible by the fact of these two things that we're surrounded by discipline, particularly the score and the conductor. But somewhere in that very, very hard discipline is a sort of freedom to be how you are at the moment. Mm. Uh, all performances are different, aren't they? You feel differently, you've gone through things, your personality changes and your experience of life, it change, changes. So uh, all that comes into it as well, which makes our performances unique. There's nobody like anybody else, mm -hmm. which is a, a, another wonderful thing to rest on, but we're, none of us are the same. We're doing the same music, but it's always of the, of the person. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think those two things are, are somehow have to come together. And when they do, it's magical. So that leads me to the third piece that I'll be singing. Um, and, and you speaking about the discipline of what is on the score. I don't know that I have met a more perfect song than Ich bin der Welt, Abandon gekommen. And 
I'm, I'm new to this. Um, I only came to it at the start of, of this period, actually. Um, I was scheduled to do it in November, um, it's hopefully being postponed, not entirely canceled. And interestingly enough, during this period, we spoke early on and I was speaking about how I was trying to take advantage of the silence in this period and and to step away from all the noise, including music at this time. But there was one piece that I, I f was pulling me that I, I had to go and look at and live with and, and I went to it almost every day was the Mahler. And the, <laughs> the journey I've taken from the first time I looked at it to now six months later, having lived with it every day, it's astonishing the companion that it has been as I've gone through my own uh, journey during this period. You lived with it for quite a long time and it was, um, if I'm not mistaken, a deeply personal song for you and you met it at many different points in your life. And now you can go back and listen to it. There's the, the deeply moving moment um, with you and Keith. Mm -hmm. Um, your husband who passed away a year ago in the end of the BBC documentary, which is so beautiful as you're listening to it together and experiencing it as a receiver at that point and not just the giver. This discipline of staying within what Rukert and Mahler have written. Can you talk to me about your journey of, of this piece and how you interpret being lost to the world? I think particularly as one grows old, I think it's a matter of age that, that comes to my mind immediately in talking about it, is the fact that um, old age, older age is a, a, a process of stripping away, um, leaving things behind, saying goodbye to things, saying goodbye to your health, perhaps, friends that depart, uh, which happens very frequently at, at my age, losing people and somehow um, putting the world into a different place. Uh, other things become important and you don't know what they are until you're actually in the middle of the, of the process. You don't know how you're going to react to loss. As somebody told me years ago that um, young singers couldn't sing Schubert when he was in this kind of mood, that singers can't sing about the deep things of life. Uh, and it used to pain me very much to hear that because in the most uh, basic and understated way, a child, a little child knows loss. It loses um, maybe a pet. It loses a toy, somebody <laughs> else has loss. Now, all these uh, uh, emotions are going through us at our various points in life, and we feel them in the way that a very young child would, or a teenager. Um, tell me any teenager who doesn't know all the things that I know at 60, 70, and 80, mm -hmm. in another way, perhaps. But nevertheless, it's as real and deep to them as, as my feelings of losses. Do you know what I mean? We all, uh -huh. We're all going through this at our various levels. Uh, and therefore you pick up a piece like the Mahler with this wonderful sense of, of slowly, slowly distancing oneself from the things that have been important. Uh, and I think uh, losing, losing dear ones is, is is probably the hardest of all, or losing a child. Losing a child at any age, I think it must be absolutely terrible. Um, and of course, Mal himself was, uh, he lost children. He, he went through all this and, and that comes through as well. The fact that he can sublimate that grief and pain um, in a piece like this. But the thrilling thing about certainly the kind of things I've been privileged to sing is the sense of uh, using my own experiences of life itself and watching the change as I've grown older that 
they are the same. You're singing the same piece of music, you're the same person, but not the same person. Life changes you. Um, uh, particularly now in the time in which we live. Uh, this, this sense of uh, tremendous change happening to the world. I've, I've never lived through a, a period like this before. Uh, even during the Second World War, which I remember, um, that changes us all, even as a child. But now is, again, a, a particular moment of turning a corner, I think, in which we're all, we're all in it together. Mm -hmm. Every age is being is being affected by this, uh, and somehow or other, in each in our different way, we have to realise that uh, certain things must happen in order for the corner to be turned. Uh, and this is how I feel about the things that I I have uh, been associated music I've been associated with all my life have. They've gone along with me, as you say, as companions. It's a very nice way to put it. It's a lovely way to put it. And I can imagine the, the, the joy you've had in that. But time itself and the way one grows older um, is another stage in that. Uh, and I think, I don't know whether I could bear to sing that song now, uh, having reached the point in life that I am. It mm -hmm. must be... I think if I'd lost a child, I couldn't sing the kinder token leader. Mm -hmm. I don't think I could bear that. They become too much for you. Yes. So, as well, we all retire at some point. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's, it's, uh, this will sound um, a little extravagant, and I don't mean it. I mean it very sincerely. I can't imagine a world where your recordings of this Mahler don't exist. I'm so glad you have them because I know they've been a source of comfort to me and to countless other people. And this is, this is the um, extreme power of, of music. And it's why in this moment, we must prioritize keeping this a part of our culture, our society, our life, not only for the audience members, but I think more importantly, to, so that people always feel invited to make music. And so they always have the ability to learn to play an instrument or to sing and have the opportunity to do it because this, it's what I feel in Didon, this necessity that this tsunami of emotions or this working things out through, as it moves through you, particularly as a singer, it allows it to come out and be processed and not stay in where isolation happens and despair and it, it darkens and it becomes poisonous, toxic inside. This, we have to be so focused on bringing music back as a, and the arts as a central pillar to who we are as a society because our humanity is based in this, is, is how I feel. And when I hear you sing the Mala, well, seeing everything that you sang, but pieces like that are such titans of the artistic canon. It connects me directly to a deep sense of humanity. And it's, it's a gift. It's a gift. You're right. You're right. The thing that has surprised me about this piece as I've worked on it is if you look at the text, and I was setting the text not knowing the mall existed. It could be quite dark and it could be quite uh, difficult. And instead, it is so peaceful. It's, it's, um, it's a kind of embrace that, that is warming you, holding you, and, and taking you. And it's extraordinary. I think that's a very um, important thing to say because I think the best kind of music, no matter what, what is happening, there's always a sense of light at the end of the tunnel. And I think that's what we've got to hang on to now. Things are probably going to be very, very different and very, very painful, as, they, as we know, from, from the situation of not being able to perform at the moment for your generation. It's a, it's a terrible thing. I hope, I hope very much we learn something valuable from it and never lose the fact that the dark times don't last forever. 
and that the arts of every kind are there to help us through. Mm -hmm. Beautifully said. I can't thank you enough for taking this time and um, supplementing. For some people, there may be people that don't know the Mahler or the Didon and to, and to bring that out in this context in this moment, I think is, is um, it's something I feel I, I want to do. I wish you such continued health and, and I just, I'm so happy and honored that you take the time here and to share your wisdom, your experience, your insight, your beautiful humanity with us. It's always good to talk to you, really. I love it, I love it, and I love you. <laughs> I love you too.